This is a test of the Bounty Park Alert System. Hello and welcome to the Boundary Pack Alert System with me, Matt Dean. I feel like this morning an alarm clock should have gone off and um, what was the song, was it? They say we're young and we both know. It's Sunny and Cher, wasn't it? In Groundhog Day when the alarm clock goes off. And here we are again, waking up again to Latics being the team who very, very generously help the team on a terrible run back to three points. That's where we're at today on the Boundary Park Alert System. It's the morning after the 1-0 home defeat to the mighty Woking. I'm joined, as always, by my man in the south. At last week, after his dinner with the Swiss, Swiss ambassador, he's back. How are you, Andy? <laughs> yeah, it was lovely, lovely dinner, yeah. Three courses at the Swiss ambassador's gaff. Did, he's always with with, with these um, Ferrero Rocher. He's always spoiling you. <laughs> was it like that? No, it was nothing like that. Uh, my <laughs> wife happened to be in Devon for the whole weekend, and so when the game was called off, I didn't fancy trying to battle recording this while having two kids running around at the same time. It was very simple. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, that's fair enough. It was good to get. It was good to get Binman's story of the of Latics and rugby. It was a nice. It was a nice bit of relief. Really, wasn't it? Because you know, it was something nice to talk about. There was no win, loss, or anything football related to talk about. It was a nice buffer to this week, really. I think. Um, but you know, the show must go on. Um, and yesterday happened. So to talk about it, we have, as usual, a fan guest. Andy, you will uh, do your fan guest introduction thing, if you please. Yeah. Uh, when was your first game, fan guest? Uh, first game was September 1980. Uh, one all draw against Bolton. Going back away, isn't it? Going back uh, away. Yeah, Mr. Google had to help me. I, I remember it vividly because uh, my uncle took me. I was seven years old and he's a Bolton fan. And I was on his shoulders in the away end, on the Rochdale Road end. And I thought I was closer to the top of the floodlights than the pitch. Uh, so it scared the hell out of me for the first first half. But I remember it vividly being one all. And uh, I had to Google it, yeah, 1980. Nice, a long time ago. I've just got to interject here. I'm having to multitask. I've got the test match on. I'm dual screening while we're doing this. And Tom Hartley's just taken a sixth wicket. He's Lancastrian on his test debut. We're one wicket away from winning. Anyway, for those cricket <laughs> fans listening, that's quite exciting. That's cheered me up a bit from Latics anyway. Let's put it that way. Um, what is your favourite Latics related memory? Definitely the semi-final 1990. Um, footballing reasons, obviously, it was just a fantastic game. But the I remember watching, what was the game before? Because it was on BBC. They, they streamed, they put both semi-finals on for the first time, didn't they? Was it Liverpool? Liverpool, it was Liverpool, Palace. Liverpool Palace in the morning, yeah. yeah. That was it. And I remember one of the commentators doing Oldham down as usual, saying, well, there's no way they're going to follow, you know, Oldham and United will follow it. Was it 4-3, I think? Because um, it was a cracking game. And I remember getting in the car, mum and dad driving down. So I'd have been, what, 17 then. And going down to Manchester, it was like there was three teams because United were going down because all the Oldham fans were going down, obviously, as well. And then the City fans were there as well. And I thought, how many teams are playing in this game? And the whole city was just alive with that match. And then when it was three all, it was just, yeah, just the whole thing was amazing. Yeah, I, I, I remember going to the game with my mum and dad and getting to Moss Side. It's been a belting up day and then hearing that yeah. Palace had just won. And uh, yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a fabulous day out. And 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 that was that day was the blueprint for what became Sky Super Sunday. They, they got the Sky got their Super Sunday idea from that day. Really? To play two games morning, afternoon, Super Sunday. And it was from right. that particular set of mm. fixtures that they, that they came up with the concept. Who was your first favourite player then? Well, from that era, from 80s, from going eight onwards, Roger Palmer. Um, I mean, I was thinking Tommy Wright because he he really stood out. And there's a couple of games he was he was brilliant. But Roger Palmer, I remember just hanging off, you know, when I'd be eight or nine, hanging off the fencing at the front. And he would just belt past like a like a thoroughbred racehorse. You know, his eyes pulsating. And he used to run. He had that really sort of um, unique gait, didn't he? He sort of walked on his tiptoes. And when he thunder past, he was a bit like Penelope Pitstop. You couldn't see his feet touching the ground. He was just lightning as he flew past. And then 
quite often stuck the ball in the goal from some ridiculous distance or yeah, he was just amazing to watch. I just mesmerized by him, yeah. My my favourite player too, um, from the same era. And then give us a little known uh, a little unknown fact about yourself. Uh, so for a short period of time in 1984, I was the world's youngest qualified snooker referee. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> that is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't last very long because uh, Dad wrote to the Guinness Book of Records to say, "Is this, uh, uh, you know, is this a record?" And he said, "Well, we haven't got a category for that, and we only publish the book once a year." And by the time they published it, a girl from Southampton had beat me. So uh, <laughs> we've never told anyone that before. So that's <laughs> that's the first. How old were you? I was eleven. Can you reach the middle of a snooker table to put the balls back in place when you were eleven? Well, that is the exact reason I had to wait because I was ready to do that uh, the exam when I was ten. But because I couldn't reach the blue spot, <laughs> you have to have one foot on the floor. We waited, and that was yeah. the whole argument with this girl down south. We didn't think she could touch the blue spot, but right. uh, yeah. <laughs> it's gone. I'm over it. It's gone. Yeah. So uh, introduce yourself, fan guest. Your name. So my name's Mike Proctor. Uh, live in Saddleworth now, but grew up in Shaw in High Crompton. Welcome nice. to the Welcome, podcast, man. Mike. We should get Thank a little you. bit of audio going. Uh, who are you? Who are you? Before before that bit, shouldn't we? So uh, see if I get bored or I get a minute. Well, while while, while you've got that, um, did you load up that bit of audio? I'll take a message you about. I did, yeah. Do you want to just play it now? Before you do, this is like we'll do we'll do a minor. Because it's related to Mike, it's a, a minor early uh, latex mind here, sli- slightly off, off piste. I've clipped four audio clips from games. See if you can name what games they're from. Uh, Adams caught freshly offside. I would suggest that Oldham are winning about ninety percent of the fifty-fifty balls. Brilliant. Obviously, feel that uh, that goal has turned the tide in Oldham's favour. That's great. Can can you name can you name the four games that I've clipped those bit, bit of audio from, and then we'll reveal why I've done it. <laughs> oh crikey, no idea. But yeah, that brings back some memories. That sound. Can you call you call any of them, Matt? The la- well, the last one is obviously like it's the shouting chanting going up. So it it, it doesn't sound like uh, it sounds very loud. It sounds like a whole ground singing it rather than just like an away end. So was that the last home game against Chef Wednesday, maybe, or no. was it the Portman Road game? Or no, no, it's a good it's a good guess. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through the four. The, the first three clips were of. Um, and this is the reason Mike's on. Is a few episodes ago, I can't remember what it was, the other side of Christmas, I think, we, we mentioned the air horn. You know, in, you know the, the modern day sort of fan base, and we, we have it with the Atletico's brilliant, these, they've got the drum, and the drum sort of gets everyone going, and then it's sort of choreographed singing and what have you. In the 80s, I vividly remember the air horn being the thing that kicked off a lot of a lot of the sort of noise on, on the terraces. And I clipped the yeah. first three clips. I had to go back and listen to some games and just, or watch mm-hmm. some games and find where the air horn was and just clip the audio. Um, so the first three are from the uh, Littlewoods Cup quarter final at home against Southampton, the FA yeah. Cup semi final at Main Road against United, the game that, that Mike talked about the second one. The third one was the Littlewoods Cup semi final against West Ham. And the fourth one, where everyone's singing going up, um, I anticipated. That, that we might be on a good mood today. <laughs> uh, that actually was from the 1987 playoffs oh, second right. leg at Boundary Park, just after Gary Williams had equalised against Leeds. Obviously, we right. 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 and obviously we didn't go up. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they, they would have all been home games because I wasn't allowed to uh, go to away games. So I could have guessed they would have been 80s and all at home. But uh, yeah. that, that is some dedication listening to that crowd noise. That's that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I thought it, 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 because, it, because it happens, you know, in the 80s, if you remember, people would, would um, the air horn would be, would be blown a couple of times a half minimum. So I didn't have to listen to much to find them. But yeah. So when we talked about that, the reason we invited you on, Mike, is, is you messaged to say, 
that was me. I had the air horn <laughs> on the terraces, didn't you? Uh, absolutely, and it'll teach me to send uh, strange men messages on the internet, won't it? Because uh, <laughs> I was uh, I was out walking the dog. It was the Rochdale game when you said about you know all the clowns on the pitch and uh, uh, messing about, and you mentioned the air horn, and I was. I was like, that that was my air horn. Uh, there was only me that had that for a while. I mean, I passed it on, and there were a couple of people when, when I went to uni in 91. That was when I stopped going regularly. But from 84 to 91, most home games, yeah, the air horn would be out. It's definitely one of those one of those things that you remember clearly in your memories from the 80s, like being in the Chaddy End, that air horn coming from behind you somewhere, like you know, for I remember it really, really well. It's just one of those, things, along with some of the songs, which a lot of which you can't repeat in uh, 2023. <laughs> um, you know, it, yeah, it was, it was great, and like you said, Andy, it was, uh, yeah, it, it, it accompanied some great memories, which which does help as well. But you know, we've we're, we're 11 and a half minutes into the podcast now, approximately, and um. I touched on it early on. We've managed to avoid it for a good proportion of time, I think, <laughs> um, by reminiscing on on some some far far superior experiences. However, let's go back to reality and let's have a let's have a think about yesterday. I think before we do that, let's just play a little bit of audio that Dave recorded from yesterday in, in uh, speaking to fans. So let's let's see what the mood was before we before we discuss it. Hi, I'm just here watching them, lads. Jeffrey. Kian. What do you think of the first half? Pretty shocking to be honest, need to step it up. So what, what do you think is missing from like did you come on Tuesday against Barnet? I didn't come tight. Did Anyone did you? I come yeah. So what do you think is missing this this game? Um, the midfield. midfield. The midfield, yeah. So what do you want to see second half? Do you want to see Dallas come on? I like Dallas come on, yeah. And what score is it gonna be? 1-0 Oldham. 1-0 Oldham, yeah. 81st Eight, minute. Who's gonna score? Norwood. Right. What score? I'm going 2 1 Oldham. Second half. Norwood and Dallas. Cheers, pal. Thanks. Oh, then. Uh, just with Tom all day. Tom, what did you think of that first half? I won't say it was overly great. It's as I expected. They've come up, they're struggling, they're making it hard for us. But as the game's gone on, we've looked the better team. We've looked more like scoring. They're just there to frustrate us, aren't they? Yeah. Trying to nick a 1 0. That's like most teams down at the bottom scrapping to get what they can. One goal and their heads have dropped because they'll have to come at us then. What score do you think it'll be, Tom? Still going for 2-0. Who's going to score? Joe Hart, I'm going to say Fondop and Dallas when he comes on. Right, cheers, mate. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm just here with, uh, what's your name, pal? Oh, no, I don't want to be on the <laughs> podcast. Come on, come on, what's your name? Um, Danny Richardson. Hi, Danny, all right. You're with Sexy Day Bradley now from the Oldham Athletic Podcast. Uh, what do you think of that first half, then? Um, weren't the best. Did you come on Tuesday against Barnet? Uh, no, I didn't. Oh, you're part-timer. <laughs> <Yeah>. Anyway... <laughs> What do you think it needs second half? Uh, more midfield work, I think. What yeah. are you struggling with, in your opinion? Um, midfielders, aren't they, really? Too much long ball. Yeah. Um, I thought we'd have been better with this new midfield, and I'm not seeing any change, really. It's only one game. Yes, it is. We've got to one. gel. Yeah. I do agree with you there. Um, Colin looks good, though, doesn't he? He does look good. The, but um, I just... Uh, they're struggling at the moment, and this is a, t- a team that's well down the lead. Yeah, they're the safe for that quick 1-0, aren't they? Yeah, I think Smashing there's ground. a lot of expectancy today from Latics. Right, well, we're going to both put you on the spot. What score's it going to be? I think, nil, it, nil. I think it'll stay 0-0, nil, nil, mate. 0-0? Nil, nil. <laughs> yeah. A 2-0 from Danny. Yeah. Cheers, lads. Thanks very much. Well, I'm not I'm not sure I agree with um with, with some of the sentiments about the smash and grab that I thought that walking were just by far the better team yesterday. I thought they if you had to pick a team that were near the top and a team that were near the bottom, it would have been the opposite way around. I thought we were I thought we were bloody hopeless yesterday. Absolutely shocking. Um the midfield has come in for some criticism again yesterday and I think it, it was bang on. I thought the midfield was atrocious yesterday. Um we we bypassed the midfield a lot, which didn't help. Um, but they didn't get a grip of the game. I was going to upload Mickey Mellon's uh, interview. Dave didn't interview me today because he was uh, said he was too annoyed after the performance to to take, you know, any like level of professionalism into the interview. So he uh, he didn't bother, um, which is disappointing because I would have liked to hear that. Um, but did you go yesterday, Mike? Yeah, unfortunately. What what was your assessment? Exactly what you said there. It's after Tuesday, I didn't go on Tuesday, but I watched it online and I thought, 
we'd done a cracking bit of business, uh, you know, the four or five transfers in January. I thought that was fantastic. And I allowed myself to get excited thinking yesterday, finally, we're going to have a team near the bottom that we can, you know, we've got our foot on the throat now of the playoffs. And now it's time to just go again. And just everyone had an off game. You know, we were defending five yards. You know, there was no press. We were, we, we were defending with our arms outstretched and dancing around like a crab sideways. Forget that. Get in the face. Tackle. You know, we, it was, everyone was off. There was just no press. There was no push. There was no, there was just no fight. I, I can't explain it because it's not like we travelled or played three games in eight days like it's been excuses in the past. It was just a complete off for everyone. There's something in the mentality there across the board within the players for that to happen. Well, I think it's got to be something along the lines of, oh, we've just got to turn up and we'll beat these because we're on a good run of form and they're down the bottom, whatever it is. I, I don't I don't like to sort of focus on these superstition type things, but everybody said it. Oh, God, Walken have won one in 13. They're coming to Boundary Park. That means, you know, like that, we, we have that knowledge because it, it happens all the time I mean, a famous one was the other se- other season against Scunthorpe on Boxing Day you know they, they were having a terrible run they come here and beat us it's probably happened this season but we've we've made teams down the bottom look really really good now to be fair to walking they grew in confidence through the game they played well they knocked it about better than we did they did they had far better moves uh, we had a couple of chances we didn't hit the target all game we didn't have a shot on target it uh, you know, Matt Hudson made a really, really good save and he came out and, and, and snaffled the ball at the feet of the attacker. Could have easily have been 2 0. The goal that we conceded right after half time was just, you know, they've come out at half time, after half time, whatever, you know, Mellon said to them, whatever they've said to each other, it's all gone out the window. They're, they're completely switched off. And it's just, it was yesterday was just disgraceful performance from top to bottom. I don't think anybody particularly came out of that, out of that game with any credit. And again, I think it's it's a mentality thing whether or not the boundary part is too intimidating for our own players in terms of being able to live up to the shirt. I don't know whether it's whether it's uh, complacency because they think you know the the better than they are. I don't know, but it to you know to quote uh, you know a friend in Shropshire. That was shite. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I listened to it yesterday um, <clears throat> while I was pottering about. I listened to the commentary, and it sounded dire. Um, it, the, one of the the um, fans said on the fans only then something that which seemed to be what I was picking up from the audio. You guys will, will know more. Is what what were the tactics yesterday? Because we we in the week I watched the game against Barnet on the TV as well. We passed the ball about okay. I mean, you know, we, we were lucky. Hudson pulled off a couple of saves to keep us in that game as well. But we we passed the ball about and we moved it. He sounded yesterday like the tactic was to go quickly to fond up and then try and pick the second ball up. So this the midfield's not on it. Well, the midfield were being bypassed. Were they? I don't know. Like, what, what was the tactic yesterday? Well, there, there weren't any apparently. Long ball hoof seems to have yeah. made a reappearance, doesn't it? It was yeah. out of nowhere. But where does that come from? This is where I'd like to. This is where I'd like to, you know, talk to Mickey Mellon maybe a bit more about that kind of stuff. He was a bit evasive in his interviews today. He put it down to a bad day. We didn't. We never really got going and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, there was too much long ball. Um, but Conlon didn't seem to be demanding the ball off the centre backs in the same way that he did against Barnet. Walking were pressing us. They were, you know, they were they, they weren't giving us time and space, but we weren't doing the same to them. And I tell you what, I'm I really I'm not the kind of person who likes to like hammer a player in particular, but I'm going to I'm going to mention Josh Lundstrom again because I thought yesterday he was completely ineffective. He did, and the reason why I've seen some people on Twitter slating Nathan Sharon saying things like he should never put on a shirt again. If it wasn't for Nathan Sharon, our midfield would have made one tackle yesterday. And he's the only player who actually wants to to press and tackle. Lundstrom was was literally, I was watching him, you were talking about crabs, uh, Mike, before, going inside. He was literally in the space in front of the defenders and between their midfielders, just kind of like 
dancing from one man to another, yeah. not putting tackles in, not wanting the ball, not having an effect on the midfield at all. It, it was it, it was like, if, I think maybe the reason that Conlon didn't get to play yesterday, as in, well, he did play, he played for 60 minutes, but he didn't get to, to do what he wanted to do with the ball was because Sherin and Lundstrom, but mainly because Lundstrom wasn't helping Sherin, wasn't creating the space for him in the midfield to do that. It wasn't, they weren't causing the, the uh, walking midfield enough problems. And, in terms of the front two, it, Norwood and Shop, uh, Shondop, Fondop seemed to be so far apart from each other that they were ineffective as a strike partnership. Norwood was like all over the place. He had another one of those games where he looked like he couldn't be arsed. He says, like, what the hell am I doing here? Um, and it was, you know, for Lundstrom to have got the player of the season last season at, at, at Altrigham, who, who since he's left, by the way, are doing better without him. So I don't know what, I don't know what that says, but like, He's not shown any of that. And yesterday, in se- the central midfield is one of the positions on the pitch. There's not, not that there's many that you can hide in. But you can't hide in centre midfield. You can't be ineffective. If you're ineffective in centre mid, then they're going to walk all over you. They're going to do what Walking did to us yesterday. Walking were able to pass the ball from their defenders through to their attackers with such ease and such pace. And whenever we got it, we give it back to them straight away. We just dumped it back to them. And collectively, whether we're lacking, you know, the leadership of, of Liam Hogan in the side yesterday, that was the only difference between yesterday and Tuesday was the fact that Hogan didn't start the game and McGay, uh, McGay did. Whether that can have such an impact, I don't know, but it was the only difference. But the, the, the difference in the performance was absolutely chalk and cheese. Yeah. Well, I, th- I think the difference in, in tactics, it was noticeable because, I, I, I mean, I'm just a fan. I understand tactics. Only a little bit, you know, I'm a typically biased Oldham fan. I can quite often not see what, you know, a manager can see. But I looked on Tuesday and you could see that when we had the ball and we were attacking, we were 3-5-2. We would push the wingers up. As soon as they got the ball, we dropped to 4-4-2. And I hadn't seen that before. And the effect that had on Tuesday, we were always a man over in midfield. We were going forward. We were pressing. That just didn't happen yesterday to the point that we were just bypassing midfield. We were just hoofing it up, which when Norwood's one of the shortest guys on the pitch, what's the point? You know, because even when he does control it, like in the Tuesday game, he was even too good for the referee to, to not get that third penalty. I mean, what a, a cracking touch. You know, it's it's just annoying to watch and, and, and see them do that when they can all perform well and perform like Tuesday. But then I don't mind, I don't mind Mike, if that's the tactic, right? If the tactic is to get the ball up high and do that, then you, the one thing your midfield needs to do is get up and support the attackers because if the if the if the if the if they win it if they knock it back then it's up to your midfield to to be winning the second balls and to be up there if you go, if you're going long that's what you're doing if, in in effect is getting the ball forward as quickly as possible it's the most effective way of getting the ball forward quickly fine but getting the ball up without the bodies is completely useless you've got to have the bodies there to, to to combat for the ball and win the ball and do something with it in the final third of the pitch so whatever the tactics were yesterday. They didn't work. They were rubbish. Now, he changed the formation, didn't he? Uh, he brought my guy off and he, um, he he brought Walker on. And Walker did all right. He looked like one of the players who actually got the, wanted to get the ball and, and you know and dribble and, and, and take people on and make something happen. I've been backing Mickey Mellon the whole time. I think he's doing a great job. Uh, I don't expect him to be able to turn it around overnight. In the same way that I didn't expect Unsworth to be able to turn it around overnight, I didn't think any manager is going to be able to turn around what we had at Latix overnight. So yesterday it was on the players, not on the manager. I think, like, like I said, Mellon's done done really well since he's come in. He's got he's got results, so the team have got results under him. At the end of the day, he's he's quick to to tell you know to 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 praise the players and say, look, it was them that got the result. It was them that got the performance. Yesterday was like dorking away, where. We played the same. We were as ineffective at Dorking, but we managed to, to to you know scrape a win. We were lucky that day against Dorking, really lucky. Yesterday we weren't lucky, and Walking deserved to to take the three points. So I want Mickey Wan to succeed, um, and I think he will. But I think his players have got to stop letting him down on games like yesterday. And we've said on this podcast over and over again that in games like this against the lower teams that the players don't win their individual battles and they don't earn the right to play. And that's what happened again yesterday against Walker, a team down the bottom. We didn't earn the right to play. Mellon said it in his interview and that's on them. And it's, 
you know, we, we go again on Saturday. We're away at Ebbsfleet on the telly. You know, we need we need a, drast, a drastic improvement, don't we? Well, they're one of those teams. You know, the, the, the three games under under Mickey Mellon that where we've played teams in the bottom four, Fylde, Ebbsfleet and Woking, and they've all turned us over. And, and, mm. and you're, right, you're right. The thing you said at the start is it has to be attitude and, and it has to be a mental thing as opposed to anything else other than I was asking about a tactic why, why did we go long ball why didn't we just get it on the floor it's not presumably not like we thought Woking were a better passing side than we could be necessarily so no but they yeah, were not, yesterday they were yesterday and they significantly yeah. so yeah but because we but because we didn't try to do that our tactic was something different which is well you remember the away game Andy you went to the away game like they the game started. It was quite open in that in that uh, first game against Walking. It was a bit end to end. There was plenty of passing, and and then what happened is we sort of slowly took control of the game and passed it around them, and they, they you know they couldn't cope with us then, and we 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 won the game at a bit of a canter. It was our best performance of the season up till that point. So when the game started yesterday, that's what I was hoping was going to happen again, like, but it just didn't. It just didn't at all. Like they they were just better off for ninety minutes, as far as I was concerned. Yeah, it's definitely. It's, a, it, it's just a. I don't like. Say it's a mental thing. It's a. It's a. It's. I, I've. I've said before. Like there's. The, it's like a cultural thing within an organisation that, like when new new employees come in, they kind of sort of adopt the culture of the organisation that they're in, as opposed to changing it. It takes time to change. So even though we've got a lot of new players in again, we still sort of have a soft underbelly on these occasions and just get turned over. And I. I mean, Mickey Mellon's done a remarkable job. With with the assets available to him in terms of in terms of points, brilliant, absolutely superb to have got us right right in the mix. Yeah, and, and I suspect I suspect we'll get a reaction. We owe Ebbs Fleet one, so let's go and perform um, on Saturday on a telly, um, and then and then go on another little run. We'll pick up some wins, and we're gonna, we're just going to have to swallow the fact that every now and again we're going to get turned over by a Southern Leisure Centre, <laughs> and then we'll have to <laughs> have to have to start again, won't we? Um, the, the the thing that's always worrying for me is with these types of things is. If we're going to, we can only go up in the playoffs because Chesterfield are untouchable for anybody, really. Um, so if we're going to go up in the playoffs, we're probably going to have to win three on the spin. Now, we've just come off back off the back of four on the spin. So you could say we we have been, we can do that. You know, like that I think that's the only time this season we have, though. <laughs> mm. So we're going to have to build up to the end of the season, hit some form where, because it's, you know, in a knockout, it is an effect and, you know, um, three knockout games, you've got to win back to back. Um, and we put one, put one of these performances in, and that's that's your that's your chance gone this season. So that's why it feel, still feels like you'd hope we can get in the playoffs, but still odds against that we've probably got enough form at the minute at least to put those three back to back wins together. And ideally, what you want to be doing is trying to catch Barnet or Bromley um, to get that home semi final tie, not having a, a quarter final tie to deal with. And everybody lost yesterday. So the, the double in fury, exactly. they yeah. all got big. So if we'd have won yesterday, yeah. close that gap, we still got yeah. to play Bromley at home. You know, you you, you really are, that you, you're putting that momentum together and, and the players have let themselves down, really, um, because we're not, we're not been able to do it. So, yeah, it's just, I mean, <laughs> I think everybody, because of the way that the Mickey Mellon has sort of dealt with it and, and, and the way that we've sort of, become harder to beat and put a string of wins together. Everybody was hoping that yesterday was the day that we turned the corner on not getting turned over at home against the Southern Leisure Centre. Yep. It, it's it's doubly disappointing that we haven't still yet turned that corner, have we? It's still, it's still no. work. It's and I just desperately, I desperately wanted to see, you know, I'm, I'm quite a visual person. I, I wanted to see those five green dots yeah. They're just what that's on the National League form thing. Five five green. And like, you look at that and you go, Yeah, right. We're uh we're absolutely I know look a you know a few months ago you'd have taken the four <laughs> out of five as well. Don't get me wrong. Like you'd rather I'd rather the four and a on a red than one red and four greys or whatever, you know, an unbeaten in five, but only picking up draws and stuff. I'm not I'm not sort of I'm not depressed um, by things in general. I'm not like, I th you know, we we're making progress. All we said this season, we want to make progress. Finishing the playoffs is great progress and we're, we're moving in the right direction. Obviously, we want to go up. That would be a massive bonus if we did. But, you know, we've we've doing a podcast like this, like we do week in, week out. You, you, you've, you, you've got a comment on the game 
that you that you just watched. And you know, after the Hendon game, it was you know typically gloomy. You know, <laughs> we've got a squad here that 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 you know, unless it's at full strength on the day on the pitch, is not good enough. Like the squad players aren't good enough. And then we get the Barnet game, which is a full strength team, and we think, oh, actually, yeah, you know, we were right that the squad players who came in uh, for, against Hendon aren't. You know, up to the level of the the first eleven, because we've just beaten you know third place Barnet, brilliant. So then it's it, it seems perfectly rational to have an expectation that you're going playing team fourth from bottom with the same players that played against Barnet that they're going to go and do so they're going to that they're going to deliver again because it was the the, the first team. So it's incredibly infuriating um, and unfortunately, like you said, Andy, when it comes to culture, it's a subconscious thing or whatever, but this. They just don't turn up, and and that that's that's the thing. There was it looked like you know you you look at some teams and you think God, there's they've got a few gears they could go up here, but they, usually they're teams that are actually cantering and doing well and 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 have, you know, playing within themselves. But I was desperate for Latic to go through the gears yesterday. It's like, why are you in second gear? What what what's going on? Like, my, you, you, where was the aggression? Where was the where was the on the front foot? Where was the will to intimidate? Walking and make them, you know, walking. We're doing all the things that that you would expect from a from a team like that coming here, wasting time, doing all the all the you know the little uh, dark arts and all that. And we just did not. The referee was letting a lot of stuff go yesterday as well. We should have been. If you got to the point yesterday where right, we need to win this game. We should have been kicking the shit out of walking and stopping them from playing. There's not enough of that. Um, well, it's interesting you say that because I was chatting to the guys ago to the match within the pub afterwards. And do you remember that uh, picture from the, was it early eighties when Vinnie Jones was literally picking up Gaza by his balls? Yeah. <laughs> a really iconic picture. Now, yeah. early on, the ref let things go. Now, if you've got a winning mentality, if you, a bit like, um, what was he called? Mark from Dorking when he said to his team, get the ball, pass it across the back because the Oldham fans will turn on the team. That's mm. a winning mentality, finding a way to win. Now, who in that team can go and pick someone up by the balls when the ref's not looking? That's what we mm. need. We, we need John Sheridan stamping on people's feet and having a little dig in the ribs, finding a way to win. And maybe it's our generation. We're a bit older. These these lads do appeal to be, appear to be quite soft. I won't use the word, word woke, but the, I don't see any of that finding a way to win, no matter what it is. And it isn't just pretty football. It's the end result. Find a way well, to get there. There, you know, that lad Daesh who was clobbering Fondop, he was doing it. He was doing, he was taking advantage of the referee's leniency yesterday. Sean Daesh's son. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> he's, and, you know, he's a, he's a beast of a lad. He's a big guy. And he was, but, it, you know, and he was, you know, my son, my Fondop's not soft. You know what I mean? He's, he's a big, strong lad. He's tough. You know, he dishes it out to his own players in training. We've heard it from Alex Reid. But it seemed to me like the intimidation was coming from from walking on us, and and I'm sorry, but at home, yeah, we we look like the away team. We yeah, for most of the game, getting bullied, you know, across the across the pitch from the, and it's not it it it's not good enough. Like maybe like you know maybe Liam Morgan is is one of those characters that 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 you know in that thrives in that kind of environment, but. It, it annoys me. It really does because that is that's that's the basics, and that's where that's you earning earning the right to play. You earn the right to play after you've out psyched, out muscled, out kicked, out hustled your opposition, and we didn't do that yesterday. And and you know, no, no wonder Latics fans get uh, frustrated at home when they're watching it because that is that's what you've got to do. You've got to win ugly sometimes, and and. <sighs> Yeah, I want to see more of that. All the all the teams that, that that get out of this division that aren't particularly blessed in terms of technique and talent, they know how to. You know, you think about the likes of the teams that make the play, not necessarily get promoted, but make the playoffs. You know, the teams like Bore and Wood and, and Bromley and all that, like you know, regularly, sort of like towards the top end. I don't know Bore and Wood out there this season, but they've they they they, they know how to do it. They know how to to bully and 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 intimidate and and. Do all the shitty things that don't make football a great spectacle to watch sometimes, but ultimately as a fan, what you want to see is just you want to see your team win games. And if we'd have if we'd have applied ourselves more in that respect yesterday, I think we might have got something out of the game, but alas, we didn't. 
Anyway, Tom Hartley's just taken the seventh wicket and won England the Test match. That's amazing, yeah. that Lancastrian lad. Go on, that's, that's unbelievable. From Who yesterday, they playing? Hey? India. Who are they playing? In India, in India, they've only lost three Test matches in ten years in their own in their own country. So it's better of a hell of a result. Anyway, for cricket fans listening, super. Yeah, cheer me up. <laughs> He's what, I'm, I, I, I'm not, I don't follow cricket as you know because obviously I don't even know who they were playing, but like. It sounds a bit like England cricket are a bit like they're either really, really good or they're really, really bad. Is that is that the way it goes? And they just you don't again a bit like Latics, you don't really know which way it's gonna go. Like they just they turn up for some like and all of a sudden beat India, like you just said, and then they'll lose to whoever. Yeah, it, there is an element of truth to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there is there is parallels to be drawn with Latics. <laughs> because yeah, which is great. I mean, you're so lucky. I suppose England do win occasionally, so there is that. But, um... <laughs> well, I, I think we can we can be positive though. Carl. Apart from yesterday, let's let's think of Tuesday because you know the the business we've done in this January transfer window. Let, we're in the playoffs. Okay, will we go up or not? I don't know. If we don't go up. Let's hope we'll do a Chesterfield next year because we've got the summer transfer window to come. Mickey Mellon clearly knows what he's doing. He's been there before. The club is in fantastic shape from a business perspective. Unfortunately, we're just not going to win every game, are we? And it is the ones we lose, we we really lose badly. And it, yes, it hurts because we've had 20 years of this rubbish now, but it's not rubbish. We're in such a great shape. I think just go for a pint, Matt, and, uh, you know, go and kick the dog and let's think about <laughs> next week. <laughs> we'll, we'll be away, so it's great. You know, we'll yeah. be back on the road, so. Well, it, it, you, you, you sort of look at what's going on elsewhere, you know. And this this is this is why patience that we, you know, and, and I know it's difficult. I'm, I'm as disappointed as everyone else is this morning after yesterday's result, but you just sort of check yourself again, like you just said, and say, well, it's just that if it is just a blip and we get going again, it, it is what it is. Um, you know, the, the Rothwells just continue to invest in this club. So the fact that they've brought in more players of the calibre, or, you know, clear calibre of Conlon and Dallas, um, you know, and creating that spine of that team um, with, with players already in there, like Norwood and, and Raglan, who's come from a higher pedigree, you know, they're building something for the future. And you can see that that, that the club is, is on an upward trajectory. It's just not exponentially fast it's gonna it's gonna take time to build and so you just got to be calm so you look around you look around the country and see what's going on at other places like reading um and swindon even you know we, we covered swindon la uh, season before last when when they got rid of leave power their terrible owner and they got an, a new owner in and it looks like their new owner is just as bad as the last one <laughs> mm. and they probably haven't done their research on him so you, you know you could be in we could be in such a a, a worse and awful position you just got to remember that and remember that you know it could be a lot worse we're, we're, we're in a good place and it's gonna it's gonna turn and it's gonna be absolutely biblical when it does not it <laughs> well yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the grand scheme of things, like I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy with, with, with where we're, where we're at, and, and what's going on. I, my frustration yesterday is purely focused on the players on the pitch, like, and I think that's a perfectly reasonable uh, thing to, 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 to do. Be and. I don't know, like you said about the manager, what the manager expected from the players. You know, if David got his finger out and actually gone and interviewed the manager after the game, then uh, maybe, you know, and asked him some tough questions, then maybe we, we, we would have known. But, um, yeah, we don't know what the manager, how he wanted them to play yesterday. I don't think you go from, play, you know, when we've, when we've been at our most effective this season, we've actually, when, I, when we've actually played well, we have, Look, compose and pass the ball around. Like when we went down to walking and we and we got a win. And went against Bromley, we, we we sort of took the sting out of the opposition. Like when we've when we've played badly and when we've um, let other teams in it, it's when we revert to type of that that just giving the opposition the ball back. And so, oh, you didn't you didn't score with that opportunity there, but we'll give you the ball back now. You can build up again and have another go. And then when you lose the ball, we'll give it you back again, and you can do that again. And we, and we'll just. We'll just defend for ninety minutes while you have a go. Um, occasionally break forward, and and you know you've got to keep the ball yeah. <laughs> during the game if you're going to do something. Like you've got to be effective with the ball. You've got to take the sting out of the game. You've got to frustrate the opposition, and we didn't do it. And all we, the only people we managed to frustrate was the home crowd at Boundary Park again, who've managed to you know sit through too many of too many games like that this season. Mm -hmm. So you know the message is to the players like you've got to show up. At Boundary Park, um, like you were lucky against Dorking, one of those green 
um, splodges on the on the on the table could have easily been uh, grey or red. It's you know, they've got to turn up and they've got to show us, and that midfield has got to start dominating games of football. It's got to start putting its stamp on it uh, on the game, and it's got to start linking up with the forwards properly. You know, it's got to start providing the forwards with with passes, with through balls to run onto. You know, we've got a like yesterday, what about that cross from uh, Sanchdev? Like, really good ball across the box. It went behind three of our players uh, in, the, in the first half. Um, you know, that was a that was a great opportunity. Um, we, and we have, to, we have to take them. You know, we had a kitchen, had a few shots, and Dallas skied one into Chaddy End. And, you know, I, c- I can... I can cope with with the old player having an off day at the office and you know not taking chances. Sharon had one, which I don't know what he was doing. He either scores world is or he's mild off yeah. in his Sharon when he has a goal. But it's it was on them yesterday. They're going to have to have a, a good look, look at themselves this week in training and, and work hard and and put it right next week. And and they've got to start winning at Boundary Park is if, if if we want to get as high at the table as possible. I think that. I mean, now, we, now we've filled the gaps. We've been crying out for the right back, sent, you know, a growler in midfield. Now we've signed the players we have. I think the one thing we miss or a successful team always has is I think we've got a great manager at the moment, but we haven't got a leader on the pitch that is the playing version of the manager. You know, like if you think of Mike Milligan uh, when he was captain, you know, with Joe Roll, they, they, they were almost like telepathic or, I mean, I hate to say it, but Roy Keane and Ferguson, you know, I hate, absolutely hate to say, but that that partnership where someone on the pitch can get hold of the youngsters and say, get a grip, get the ball on the floor and pass it forward or whatever it is. We, we miss that. And it's almost like when one has an off day, they all have an off day and there's no one there to, you know, if Norwood is, a, is sulking around up front, he's not getting the opportunities or the, you know, the, the, the service he needs. There's no one there. There's no one that can bang the heads. You know, John Sheridan, let's go back in the time machine and sign him again. That's what we need. Even when he couldn't run and he just went round in the centre of the, uh, you know, the, the midfield circle, he, was, he still bossed the game. He still controlled it and up the tempo or down the tempo. He, he just added that that layer of leadership where we don't seem to have at the moment. Well, I, I was, I'm, I'm hoping Tom Conlon turns into that sort of play. He looks like he's got that yeah. sort of pedigree. He's captain Port Vale before. Um, so, yeah, I I agree with you. It does need, you know, and and Liam Hogan to a degree does that. From you know, maybe we did miss Liam, and Hogan. he wasn't he's there not, yesterday. Yeah, he's he's not the most gifted footballer, but maybe his leadership skills at the, at this level are actually you know worth quite a lot of merit in the side, and that's why he's been regularly picked. It'd be interesting to see whether he's whether he's retained. I think his contract runs at the end of the year. I guess it would depend what division we're in. But yeah, you know, I think Rag starting to sort of become a bit more of a, a presence in it at, at centre half. And I think when you look at next season with Hudson, who he, Hudson to be fair, he's turning out to be a really good goalkeeper. Yeah. Hudson, Raglan and Hobson. I would need to see a bit more of that leadership from Hobson, I think, but he's still quite young. Uh Conlon and then Norwood. You have got that spine of, of Fine, players yeah. that you would expect yeah. to see that kind of leadership from. Um yeah. so yeah, yeah, hopefully next season we'll you know, we'll retain all those players, and that'll be that'll be something that. Well, and, and this and there's a lot to move out in there. So we're, we're obviously trying to shift. We're obviously been trying to shift um, Kurt Willoughby, uh, which is a, a, the most monumental and spectacular failure I think I can think of. <laughs> having, having scouted him for months and months and months to have signed him, and then worked out once we'd signed him, he wasn't good enough, which is clearly what the club think or the, 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 the managerial staff have thought. And bear in mind, we've had three managers have a, lot of, have a look at him. I think he's pretty pretty poor. Um, but we're clearly trying to move him, Shelton, Nuttall, potentially even Alex Reid on. Um, but they're all proving difficult to get off the books because they're all on relatively good wages because we, we've got a, a reasonable budget. So that's, you know, all this is, is, is going to be problematic. I mean, there was rumours that Halifax are very close to signing Mark Shelton, but obviously yeah. severance packages are not able to agree. Um, so we and, and we've got potentially other players lined up, but we can't bring them in until we've moved some on. I quite like that because it's the, the board sort of putting the foot down and saying, No, you can't just spend completely willy nilly, there has to yeah. be some cost control here. Um, which I think is the right attitude. Um, but we've obviously been looking at wide players because we've been linked with a few. Um, obviously, we, we, we've signed Walker. Would you call Walker a wide player or a forward and a three? I don't know. Um, Obviously, there was the chat about the Barnet lad, um, but 
the, the, I saw on Twitter this week, uh, Kean Hayes of Fleetwood, who's a wide player. We've been linked with him. He was on loan at Rochdale earlier this season. He played well against us in, in that away game. Uh, someone has linked us, linked us to him. So we're clearly still looking at wide players. But I think one of the things that's probably the most pleasing about the recruitment in the in the January sort of period, not that we operate in a window, is just that A, the quality seems, seems on face value to be better than what we were punting in the summer. And the other thing is there's some structure to it. <laughs> We need a centre midfielder, get one. We need a right back, get one. <laughs> so when it, we seem to be sort of targeting the, the the places that everyone can see has been missing instead of putting rhomboids in star shapes. <laughs> yeah. I think I think the I think why players is you know I mean it sort of depends how you want to play, but like you know you identify talking about tactics just today in the long ball, you know, like you've got to, you've got to have players in a system that work for you and. We're not getting enough balls into the box. If you've got Fond up on the pitch, you've got a, a Norwood. It's it's not rocket science to suggest that you've got to have Norwood and Fond up in the box, and then you've got to get ball in the box, right? So that's if they're going to score goals, sometimes that means like you know, it seems to me that Mark Kitchen doesn't seem to be getting to the byline any and putting balls in anywhere near as much as he was. Maybe that's because teams have figured out that you know you've got to, you've got to try and deal with him and and and, and stop him from doing that. But I don't know. He's, he, he, Maybe he's just on, you know, not on a particularly great run of form at the minute or something. I don't know, but he was the one outlet that you could sort of guarantee was going to get balls into the box. That's not really happening anymore. Um, you know, the long ball doesn't work because, like we said before about the midfield, uh, you know, you've got to get up the pitch and, and make that work and you've got to be drilled at it. You know, the reason why it works for certain teams is because they just do it over and over and over again in training and that, and they know how it works. We've got, we, we've still at that point of what is our identity? What, how do we play? And, and I don't expect us to sort of like necessarily have that all at this point, especially with the issues that we've had with transfers, with buying players that haven't worked out. It is going to take time. Mickey Mellon saying it's going to take time. I completely agree with him. It is going to take time. It's only going to be once he's got the players that he wants for the system that he ultimately wants to play at the minute he's trying to make do with what he's got because that's that's the stats what happens when you when you come to a club and you you, you inherit a squad you've got to just kind of like make do with what you've got he, he he'll be thinking for next season the season after how he wants to play what types of players he wants to bring in to play that way so we're going to have to wait and see what happens in terms of bringing players in, bring, letting players go and, and see what kind of style Mickey Mellon wants to play. Um, and then assume that once he's got the players to play the systems that he wants to play, he's going to drill them and drill them and drill them in training so that they absolutely know what it is that they want to do and how it is that they're going to do it. Because when we watch the teams like Chesterfield, Notts County, um, Wrexham, the teams that do well, whether it be Bromley, um, they, they know how they play and they play it more consistently week in week out even it's either brilliant to watch like Notts County or super effective like Wrexham or whatever and it, and it, and it gets results we, we're not there and that's you know there are numerous reasons for that so you can't blame the manager you can't blame necessarily the players like fully into although yeah you know yesterday I think you can say that we expect a lot more but it's just a, a product of where we are and the and how unsettled we've been for such a long time that this ultimately is kind of inevitable until why it's why it's important that we have a manager in situ for quite a long time to 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 put the the put the thing right put the pieces right and 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 build a squad that is compatible with each other and we still we still don't have a compatible squad at the minute and that's the thing so Mellon needs time He'll get the time now, I'm sure, because the fans like him. Um, he's he seems to be doing a, a good job with what he's got. So, yeah, it might be that next season, you know, we, we're a different kettle of fish. Um, it might be that we finish this season really strong. We don't know, do we? Because, like we've said already on the podcast, from game to game, we don't know what we're going to get. But um, one thing that one one performance that does need to be strong, Andy, today is is Mike's Lattice mind. Yeah, oh dear. Isn't it? We, can, we can do it now if you we want. Haven't, yeah. we, ready, haven't, Mike? we haven't forgotten, Mike. Oh, damn. You oh know, you, your first game was in 1980. There's a lot of there's a lot of ground to cover there. Do you know what I mean? You say, you, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, just, the last 15 years don't really count, do they? Because uh, 
yeah, they were the last 15 years and everything before that I've sort of forgotten. But apart from that, <laughs> I'm hoping to smack it out the park with one. I mean, that'll, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, yeah. They're, all, they're only easy if you know them. So maybe you'll <laughs> know some. So, right. Good luck. Here we go right. with the uh, the new Lattice Mine theme su supplied by my mate, Matt Berry. So thanks for that, Matt. Here we go. <laughs> In what year did Latix get their famous electronic scoreboard? Eighty-nine. Correct. Yes. Who not? Who not? Latix out of the FA Cup in two thousand and eighteen nineteen. Doncaster. Correct. Oh, can we finish? Not counting caretaker or interim. How many permanent managerial appointments have Latix had since Joe Royal left in 1994? Oh, God. 23. 26. Oh. Who scored the first goal of John Sheridan's last spell in charge? Pass. Whose squad number was number nine? In Latic's last Premier League season of 93-94. Andy Ritchie. Wrong. It was Ian Olney. How many consecutive games did Latix win during their 1973-74 third division title win? Ten. Correct. <laughs> Which player signed as a defender arrived from Everton in March 1988? Uh, Earl Barrett. Wrong, it was Ian Marshall. Oh. Who did Latix suffer their heaviest defeat against in the title winning season of 1990 91? 91. Pass. Who knocked Latix out of the FA Cup in 2021 22? Uh, Ipswich. Correct. Andy Ritchie scored 20 or more goals in both... <laughs> Started to finish. Andy Ritchie scored 20 goals in all competitions in 87-88 and 89-90. Which other player achieved the same feat in both seasons? Um, oh, Roger Palmer. Correct. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Top that, like that. That's unheard of. That's I'm, I'm never coming on again. Not that you'll invite me, but I'm never coming <laughs> back. That's, uh... Five. That is a very, very good score, that, mate. Five with two passes. Yeah. Right yeah, up yeah. there. Right up there. So yeah. let, let's let's do the two passes, because you might kick yourself on some of these, on these two as well. I should have guessed, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who scored the first goal of John Sheridan's last spell in charge? Matt? Uh, it was was it against Bristol Rovers? Uh, no, think of Mikey's commentary. Oh, it was uh, Junior Lawamba away uh, at Scunthorpe. One yeah, nil. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who did Latic suffer their heaviest defeat against in the title winning season of 1991? We got absolutely thumped five one away somewhere that year. Grimsby, Oxford. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Top effort. That, that was it. Yeah, I'll, no, great I'll effort. Yeah. I'll tell, I'm going straight to the pub now. That's on the <laughs> What a yeah. What's that guy doing in the corner opening bottles of champagne? I just got five <laughs> on Latics mine. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Brilliant. Good effort, Mike. Thank yeah, you very much. Effort. Very good effort. Yeah. Um just just on other bits to wrap up, like a bit of admin, admin section. <laughs> yeah. Um today. Is the day that Ruffy Heads start their, I think it's a, a warm up pre season game at Boundary Park. So they're playing at three o'clock today on the pitch, aren't they? Right. I don't know, are they? <laughs> yeah. Passing people by this, isn't it? 
Halifax yeah. Panthers at Boundary Park, first game for Ruffyheads today. Right. Going to see how that pitch wears up now, aren't we? Between, I know, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Honestly. it's it's built for it. You know, it's part it's part of it. it is what it is. And it's great. You know, you've got to... Because part of you thinks, oh, no, the pitch is going to churn. Yeah. Well. And then, but then part of you remembers that it's use of Boundary Park um, 12 months a year and, and, and yeah. that's a great thing and, and revenue for the for the club. And yeah, and we, 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 we want the club to have a, both a successful football team and a successful rugby league team, don't we? So and that's all part of it, isn't it? So. Well, I'm not. I'm no. I'm no rugby league fan, to, to be honest. But if I've I've sort of had a little look to see what's going on. Apparently, we're we're, you know, I say we, Latte, you know, yeah. Oldham, Ruffy, Ruffy Heads are, are looking favourites to to get promoted because they've signed a lot of players with Super League experience, and obviously they're they're going to try and push to get in there with the facilities at Boundary Park. Then that's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. And they've got Sean Long, who obviously is someone that everyone will know, even if you're not a rugby league fan, who's a pretty famous yeah. rugby league player. He's he's the coach. So. You know, yeah. Best of luck to them. You'd think normally, wouldn't you? If if and and when when Wigan and Huddersfield and I think the Hull do it as well, where the rugby league team play at the same ground as the football ground, I I think they alternate the home and away games to make sure that the pitch is only used once a weekend. I think. Mm. So I found, I've, I've, I sort of scratched my head a bit. While I was like, well, "Hang on a minute, we're at home the day before they're playing. That's two days on the bounce. It's going to be used." You're like, "Wow." Hopefully that won't be going on in the season because that'll be harder for the ground staff, presumably. Yeah. And then did you see did you see Worthing FC? You've got I've got to don my heart to Worthing FC. <laughs> yeah. uh, for they, they signed um they signed Dylan Fage in the week, who scored on his debut, bless him. But they dug out Paddy's uh Paddy questioning um Mo at the at uh Wright and Cricket Club in the in the fans forum in 2009. I thought that was brilliant to have done that research. Quality, I, I, yeah, I mean it makes you wonder how they actually came up with that, didn't they? Where they found it from. I mean, that's uh yeah, well, very. It was very, very good. They must. It, yeah, it makes you feel that they must have been aware of it already. Maybe there's a Latics fan working at uh, working at Worthing. Poss- possibly. Although I've, I've I have heard this when I've talked to other other um, clubs that, like podcasts that other clubs when I've had a chat to them and stuff. They say that if our hashtag is particularly virulent, is probably yeah. the word. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of content on our hashtag. Whereas on other clubs' hashtags, if you ever go and look, it's actually quite banal or pretty pretty placid stuff. And we're, we're absolutely if, if, on, the, on our hashtag. It lights up. So I suspect that if you're a general football fan, you probably come into contact with some Latix fan going on about some nonsense at some point, and they've probably found it that way. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I mean, he's he's moved around a bit now. I mean, it's interesting to because he went. He was at I think the last last club I remember him being at was was he at Ratcliffe or? Did he no, he was. He was. He'd gone to. He got. He he did five minutes at, at Macclesfield. They they bid yeah, him off. Yeah. And he then he went to St Albans City, uh, so down here. All right. So he's um, heading down south. Yeah. And he's had, he's had these contract cancelled there by mutual consent to go slide for Worthing. But I mean, I should point out. I think Worthing a second in National League South. So he's right. he's found he's found his level at you know. Well, bear in mind. I think we signed him when we were in. Did we sign him when we were in League One or League Two? I can't remember. That shows you how terrible Mole Lemsgam was <laughs> signing players at that level. But. Um, you know, he's probably found his level at tier six, but if we don't get well, out of this division, he could be coming to Boundary Park next year for Worthing. Well, <laughs> that 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 depends on whether or not he actually completes his uh, his journey south and ends up back across the English Channel um, <laughs> in fr- playing in the uh, League Catra in France or whatever it is. You know what I mean? So, so yeah. So, well, best of luck to him anyway. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, he was uh, he was always doing his best, wasn't he? So, um, him and who and countless others. Um, so best of luck to him. Um, and yeah, that's it. We're just literally coming up to the one hour mark now. So we will uh, call it a day. Um, Mike, thank you and congratulations on your very, very good Lattice Mind score. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks for inviting me on, chaps. It's uh, it's great listening every week. And we just need to stay positive. We're in a great spot now. We just got to look forward. Um, I love the Atletico's new flag yesterday, by the way. Saw yeah. that one in So, yeah. what, what's the story behind that? Do you know? Is there a. Didn't, was it Yard Dogs, was it? Was it I, think so. I, think, I think they've done it before. They've had it before yeah. and they've, they've pulled it out again. It's. Um, I mean, it obviously dates back to the to, to the 80s when we remember yeah. those. Blow-up, when we had the yeah. little. Uh, yeah. But, they, they, yeah. but like everything, you know, as um, 
it seems to me this these days it's got bigger, it's got more muscles and uh, <laughs> yeah. you know more teeth. And all I think that it's a damn stuff. breed, actually, looking at it yesterday. Yeah, it looks like, yeah, it's XL bullies, I think. But listen, <laughs> what we need on Saturday against Edgefleet and back at Boundary Park is we need those players to take note of that yard dog flag. And when we have teams, especially at Boundary Park, we need the very minimum of ankles biting, if not taking teams on by the throat. So yeah. sort your heads out, lads, and bring your air on next week, mate. Let's have Boundary Park... Her, her, honking away. <laughs> nice one. Come on, Oldham. Let's finish this season strong. Playoffs, trip to Wembley. It's still on. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thank you for listening to the Boundary Park Alert System, a QPod production hosted and produced weekly by Matt Dean, Andy Halliwell and Dave Bradley. QPod is Oldham's only dedicated podcast production company and if you'd like to learn more about how podcasting can help take your brand to the next level, visit kupod.co.uk. A huge thank you goes to all those people who subscribe to the podcast on Spotify. We really appreciate you all. Please visit oafcpodcast.co.uk and click Be a Supporter or find the link in the show notes if you'd like to help us fund the show it's only 2 99 per month to subscribe but if you'd rather make a one-off donation please visit buymeacoffee.com forward slash oafc podcast or click the link on our website don't miss the latix football phone in every wednesday live from 8 30 p.m please visit youtube.com forward slash at oafc podcast and do hit subscribe while you are there you can also follow and interact with us on facebook twitter instagram and tiktok at oafc podcast Big thanks go to Eileen Finnegan for writing our excellent weekly blog, which we encourage you to read on our website every Saturday morning, and also to Paul Prendergast for providing us with all the Latix Mind questions. The title music for the show is by Manchester DJ and producer Starion, and for more information, visit bandcamp.com forward slash red laser records. If you'd like to be a guest or contribute to the show, we would love to hear from you. Until then, see you next time.